My name is Sue Kelly, and I'm a member of the Board of Trustees of the Unitarian Universalist Society of Amherst. I use she, her pronouns. I use glasses that are not the right distance <laughs> for this information. <laughs> Welcome to you, old friends and new, young and old, in the Zoom and in the sanctuary. You're an essential part of our service and celebration here today. Whether today is your first or your thousandth Sunday in our midst, we are stronger because you are here. We are one people of many beliefs, many origins, many sexualities and genders. We are all growing, all learning, all loved, just as you are. You are welcome here. My name is Andrew Cote, my pronouns are he, him, and I am so excited to be celebrating Beltane with you all today. A couple of days early, but Beltane is a season, not a day. That's what I'm going with. And I just want to invite you to come into this time today with a fresh look, with a fresh mind, with a mind that is open, open to new growth, open to change, open to movement, and open to stillness. I want you to feel your feet on the ground. Feel what is solid beneath you. And what is solid beneath that. Feel what is solid about you and also what is fluid. Feel the stillness of the air. Feel where you are and be where you are. Today there is childcare for our youngest kids downstairs and I'm inviting our elementary students and older to stay here. There will be time for movement and activity and interaction and I think it will be a lot of fun. Um, we are so glad to have so many children in our congregation. And with children comes noise and wiggling and movement. With children comes off-key singing that is not only children. <laughs> and so I want you to embrace that we have these people in our congregation of all ages. All right, good morning, everyone. Apologies for being late. <laughs> it's the way. Um, my name is Betsy. This is Letty. And we're excited to call you to worship this morning with some words by Starhawk. We are all longing to go home to some place we have never been, a place half remembered and half envisioned we can only catch glimpses of from time to time. Community. Somewhere, there are people to whom we can speak with passion without having the words catch in our throats. Somewhere, a circle of hands will open to receive us. Eyes will light up as we enter. Voices will celebrate with us whenever we come into our own power. Community means strength that joins our strength to do the work that needs to be done. Arms to hold us when we falter. A circle of healing. A circle of friends. Some place where we can be free. Let's say these words, let's say these words together as we light the towers. We light this flame to invite a world of peace, where we heal the wounds, where we share what we have with one another, where justice is another word for relationship, and we listen for what love has to say. Thank you so much. Our first song this morning is pretty special. This is a song that was written by uh, singer, songwriter, and peace activist Sarah Pirtle. And she co-wrote it with five of her campers at her camp called Journey Camp that happens every year. 
And so last year, my daughter learned this song, and she taught it to me. And I am so excited to bring it to all of you today. The words are in your order of worship and on the screen. It's a little bit uh, wordy, but I think we can do it. So I'd like to invite you to rise in body and spirit and join us in singing Mama's Weaving. Mom, I can't keep my fingers moving. Teach me to do what you do. And through the strings, the shuttle flies like the birds up in the skies. When we weave, we turn again like the waves upon the sand. The weaving grows in our hands. For the sunset purple yarn, for the sunrise pink and red for good luck i hold the yarn when i'm sleeping in my bed and through the strings the shuttle flies like the birds up in the skies when we weave we turn again like the waves upon the sand the weaving grows in our hands Someday my daughter too may weave and make the branches of this tree. This pattern's passed a thousand years through her great grandmother down to me. And through the strings the shuttle flies like the birds up in the skies. When we weave, we turn again like the waves upon the sand. The weaving grows in our hands. The weaving grows in our hands. The weaving grows in our hands. So, today I am going to tell you a story about weaving. It is how the universe was woven together. Don't worry, I'll tell you what to do with it in a minute. <laughs> so this is a Navajo creation story. And at first, the world was small and pitch black. There were four seas and an island. And in the middle of that island was a single pine tree. Ants and dragonflies and locusts and beetles, they lived there and they made up the air spirit people of the first world. Now the second world was known as blue, where life was given to spider woman and spider man, but not the ones you might be thinking of. <laughs> Only their inner spirits or their souls were made. Their physical bodies were made later to contain their spirits when they evolved into future worlds. Now in the third world, the Holy Ones advised Spider Woman that she had the capabilities of weaving a map of the universe. And the geometrical patterns of the spirit beings in the night sky. Now at first, she did not know what they meant. Weaving had not been invented yet. But curiosity became her energy and driving force to learn to weave. And on a beautiful day when she was out in the land exploring and gathering food, she came upon a small young tree. She touched it with her right hand and wrapped her fingers around one of its branches. And as she was letting go, a string streamed out of the center of her palm and wrapped around the tree branch. She was not quite sure what that string was. At first, she took her hand to release the string, but it wouldn't break free. She thought if she kept wrapping the string around the branch, it might let go. She started maneuvering and manipulating the string into various shapes. And at this particular moment, 
she realized this was the weaving she had been instructed to do. Immediately, she sat down and she broke the string with her left hand without hesitation. And she thought carefully of how to use her new gift. The rest of the day, she sat close to the tree and she wrapped the string into various patterns on other branches. The Holy Ones heard about Spider Woman's new talent and they came to visit her. During the visit, they instructed Spider Man to construct a loom and create tools in the processes of weaving. The Navajo, or Diné, today live in a fourth world, known as the glittering world. Young weavers are instructed to find a spider web in the early morning, glistening with sunlight and sparkles, and place the palm of their hand right up to the spider's webbing without destroying or damaging it. At that moment, Spider Woman's gift of weaving enters the young weaver's spirit, and it lives there forever. And so I am going to invite the children to become weavers today. You all have a little loom, and if you pull off the clothespin, you can use that to help guide your yarn through the strings, weaving up and down, back and forth, changing the colors as you like. When you are done, take it home and have an adult help you cut the back strings and then tie them in groups of two and that will secure your weaving. If you need help, you can see me after service or you are welcome to uh, send me an email. If anyone else would really like a loom, there are a few over here, <laughs> okay. <laughs> The ones over there might not have uh, paper clips. And now I am going to invite the congregation to rise in body or spirit and join in singing our hymn of the month, number 397. <laughs> Morning has come. we start, if anyone does not have three ribbons, uh, raise your hand and we'll find a way to get you some ribbons. Does anyone not have ribbons? All right, we have one, two, three. So uh, one of our greeters will bring some ribbons around for anyone who did not end up with ribbons. So over the last couple of years, this congregation has gotten to know me, <clears throat> and I've gotten to know you. But one thing that you might not have learned about me is that I am an absolute sucker for really, really cheesy metaphors. <laughs> and I don't mean ironically. So, do you all know that icebreaker activity that you hate? where you toss a ball of yarn across a circle and you learn people's names or a fun fact or some other tidbit. 
and you all hold on to part of the string, and then in the end, you've woven a web, and you're all connected. I love that. <laughs> I did this for the first time at church camp when I was 11, and I was like, this is the most meaningful thing I have ever done in my entire life. It is possible I am the only person with that reaction to any icebreaker. I own that. And it's a good thing that I loved it so much. Because from there, I went on to hippie college, and I worked in LGBTQ organizing for a long time, and I've been active in UU congregations for a while now, and I have done a lot of yarn webs. I still love them. I have already made the kids in our congregation do variations of this activity twice. I have not yet finished my second year. We celebrate Beltane on Wednesday and through this season. That celebration of newness and change and new growth. That celebration of weaving as we weave the maypole, as we weave our hopes and dreams with one another, as we weave our songs and dances and lives and stories in with those around us and deep into the earth herself. There is just something about string, fiber, that is just rich with metaphor. I want you to take a minute and think of all of the words or sayings or phrases that we use in our day-to-day -day lives that relate to string or fiber or yarn in some way. When I was doing this, I thought of weave a story, follow that thread, tie up loose ends, dyed in the wool, cut from whole cloth, spin a yarn. Around the world and through so many religious, spiritual, and cultural traditions, you can find references to stitching, sewing, weaving, spinning, knitting, knotting, turning string in some way into something that is more than just string. And these tales are shared orally or through explanations in knitting patterns you find online or in children's literature. So I know that pandemic lockdown was hard for everyone in different ways. In my case, we had a four-and-a-half-year-old and an almost one-year-old in a 500-square-foot house that we had already told our landlords we were moving out of that May. So we were trying to figure out how exactly one rents and buys a house across the state during a global pandemic. Almost equally challenging, my oldest kid was newly obsessed with Magic Treehouse and could not yet read. Who here has read Magic Treehouse books? Right? Now, I had a whole piece in here on my thoughts about the evolution of the Magic Treehouse books. <laughs> but it hit like a good four paragraphs and I had to cut it for time. But if you find me after the service, I am so happy to get into it. However, in some of the later books, once the author, the esteemed Mary Pope Osborne, had exhausted the normal things like dinosaurs and Pompeii and ancient Japan, the kids in the story, Jack and Annie, started getting sent on missions by Merlin, who is in this whole thing, to another realm and yeah, this is where the series went 
somewhere. <laughs> Jack and Annie, who are seven and nine, maybe? Seven and nine. I've been, it has been confirmed by the experts. They have to save Excalibur from the depths of a cove that's guarded by a sea serpent with the help of Kathleen, who is a selkie. They all turn into ravens to rescue the Diamond of Destiny from this raven-human hybrid. They save Camelot by riding a white stag to the other world to get the water of memory and imagination. And in my favorite, they travel to the land of the Ice Wizard to retrieve Merlin's staff of strength. In order to get it, they have to retrieve the eye of the ice wizard by finding the sisters of fate who direct them to the frost giant who turns out to be a metaphor. It's a whole thing. But within the magic treehouse, there is always some thread of fact. Sometimes there's more fact. Sometimes there's less, but there is some fact or tradition or history that runs through them. And in Winter of the Ice Wizard, the sisters of fate are the Norns of Norse mythology who weave the fates of everyone in the world, each string representing a life. And in listening to that, in the spring of 2020, as we were approaching Beltane, it struck me again just how powerful of a metaphor strings are. We talked about Spider Woman during the Time for All Ages, but there are so, so many more of these stories. In his article, Deep Weaving, Indigenous Earth Wisdom, Mythology, and Cosmology, author Daniel Wall explains, in Greek mythology, Ariadne's, Ariadne's thread helped Theseus to safely reach the center of the labyrinth and find his way out again. Athena, the goddess of wisdom, was a weaver, and so was her Egyptian counterpart, Neith, the creator of life. In Lithuanian myths, Lima Dahlia is the goddess of destiny, the spinner and the weaver of the threads of life. The Mayan goddess Ixchil is the goddess of childbirth, healing, and weaving. The Japanese sun goddess Amarat, sorry, Amateras is the protector of all people and weaver of the robes of the gods. The Maori goddess Hine Te Iwa Iwa gave people the art of weaving as a way to weave knowledge and wisdom between generations. Similarly, among Australian Aboriginal tribes, the hand-woven dilly bags and baskets are not only functional objects, but a way of weaving identity, meaning, and wisdom between present generations and their ancestors. I think you'll note with me of all of the examples named and almost all that I could think of, women were at the center of them. It was women who in these stories are providing that structure and stability. Even if it feels random to everyone else, there is a plan, a structure, Someone is guiding the seeming chaos. As you might have guessed, I am not one for gender essentialism, but it felt, felt powerful to me when I was in my Greek gods and goddesses phase in middle school. Did anyone else have this phase? <laughs> yeah. Middle school is when you have it. There were women who were in so many ways powerful and strong, they were using these often female-coded activities, but they were not meek or powerless. They were using them to drive great change. They had power. They could make things happen. As I grew older 
and learned that feminist was not a bad word. I was learning the unspoken stories of women who broke barriers and rules and glass ceilings. Women who didn't take no and acted with deliberate intention. I remember thinking, wait, but they're not acting like men. They're women who are doing powerful things because they are powerful. Is everyone having so much fun with this weaving project I gave you? <laughs> Sorry, the strings are so long. Uh, okay, so they were these women doing powerful things. And weirdly, this pretty small teenage feminist realization was one of the defining moments years later when I decided to transition. If women could be powerful and strong and drive change, then I could also break gender stereotypes. I didn't have to be the version of man that I didn't like. So I've been thinking a lot lately about decisions, about what it means to make a choice, and how choices often seem final, but they are just another small string. And I've been thinking about ritual and spontaneity. To me, ritual and spontaneity feel like they're in opposition. Ritual is planned, scripted, it's set. First you're doing this, then you're doing this, and lastly, this. It's like weaving or a well-written knitting pattern. You do what it says, and you get what you want. When you weave on your loom, you have a warp. And that's those straight threads on the little looms that some of you have, those ones that were already on there. And then you have your weft. Things go in a specific order. They have their jobs. And when you do your job, you get something beautiful in return. Over the past year, I've been into this author named T. Thorne Coyle, specifically their nonfiction books on ritual and practice. And in their book, Crafting a Daily Practice, they say daily practice supports our lives. It helps us to know ourselves better. Daily practice enables us to return to the center more quickly. Daily practice becomes the foundation upon which we build our lives. By connecting to ourselves, daily practice connects us to the world outside. This helps us cultivate lives of greater clarity and service. And that feels good to me. I love daily practice. I love ritual. But life does not follow a ritual. Things happen in life. And I have been just noting and seeing and trying, trying to be open to those things that I can't know perhaps things that nobody can know. This morning, at least four of you asked if I was going to define what wend meant in the sermon title, uh, Weaving and Wending. Wandering, I'm getting there, wandering is more of a mindset, says Lyanda Lynn Haupt in her book Rooted, life at the crossroads of science, nature, and spirit. Wandering brings mind and movement into healing congruity. The root of the word wander lies in the Old English wandering, to wind or to wend. 
wandering or wending is goalless, aimless, directionless. The motion of our steps guided not by a set path or route, but by the inclination of our spirit. Off-grid, off-line, off-map. We may set forth to wander with a light pack or nothing at all. Has anyone here ever been lost in the woods? Yeah, did you follow a trail? Did you try to? Did it not work? I am not a wender by nature. I do not like wandering aimlessly. It scares me. I don't feel at peace or at one with the world when I am lost in the woods and do not have cell phone service. I feel like I would like to have cell phone service. To go where your body leads, even if your mind doesn't know why. To wander, to wend. As hard as it can be for me to accept the I don't know or the I guess we'll find out, I think the combination of linear structured weaving with allowing the unknown, the unplanned, the unseen, the mystery, the spirit to come in and cross a couple of those strings, to add in new color, to change up the pattern, that is where at least I seek to fall. Allowing for the loom of ritual to hold room for those loose wending strings to come in and make something wholly new. Because real life isn't neat and tidy weaving. As we move through our lives, our strings don't stay on a straight path. Some more than others. Laying down carefully planned rows and sections of color, no matter how much we have planned, doesn't always work out. We interact with each other. Our threads get woven or even tangled together, sometimes for a long time and sometimes for a few short rows. The tapestry that flows behind us, growing through our lives, is messy and weird and unique. It is modern art. Those warp strings of ritual, of structure and balance, hold firm as those weft threads of graduations and ill-advised high school partners and marriages and breakups and first grandchildren and best friend fights and winning the seventh grade science fair all move in their chaotic way through that life ritual. Looking back, sections of your life's tapestry may look nearly as you planned out, while other sections look like you handed the weaving over to a mischievous orangutan while you stepped out for an afternoon. And so I want you to take those strings, those ribbons that you came in with, into your hand, hold them, look at them, maybe let them run through your fingers, Think about the colors that you chose. Think about why you chose them. For me, I picked blue to represent the water, the water that can flow around and through, the water that can create incremental change or that can destroy in minutes. I picked red for that fiery, dynamic change that sometimes happens, for that change that can seem all-encompassing. 
And I picked black for loss. Over the last year, I have lost a number of people, some metaphorical and some who passed away. And so think of the last year of your life and maybe think of the year ahead of you. What are the dominant threads that you have running behind and ahead of you? Has the last year been a time of peace, coming more out of the pandemic into a structure that feels familiar and predictable? Has there been big cataclysmic change in your life, whether unexpectedly amazing or life-alteringly awful? Most of us will have more than one of these. And so as you contemplate your colors, think of what those colors spark in you. Think of what it means to have these different threads of your life woven or braided together. What the colors officially mean is less important than the meaning that you give them. So take your ribbons, knot them together at the top if you haven't already, and start to weave, or twist, or knot, or braid. Not the ribbons, the threads of this year of your life together. The end result does not have to be perfect. You might want it to be perfect. You might want a perfect tight braid, but end up with sections where your ribbons were much less interested in what you wanted. Maybe two of those threads got knotted together and made a weird bump, while the third just hung out to the side. Maybe you want to weave your year together with that of your partner or your children. For those at home, I invite you, if you brought string, to begin weaving or knotting or braiding or twisting the strands of your year together or simply writing down all of those threads that your year carried, not in perfect straight lines, but maybe overlapping or intersecting. Through the rest of the service, I invite you to continue with your weaving, with your braiding, with your knotting, I invite you to let the mistakes and the imperfections happen. Maybe not even go back to fix them. I invite you to allow this to hold some of the energies of your year, the positive, the negative, the neutral but still somehow challenging. And so as you make another couple of moves with your ribbon, I invite you to find a place to stop and hold that because we are going to rise and sing in body or spirit hymn number 1068 in your teal hymnal or here on the screen.
to join me in the spirit of prayer or meditation or simply silence. Spirit of life, help us to be present with all that is our life, both our deepest sorrows and our greatest joys, so that we can truly live, engaging fully in our own life and in our community. Spirit of community, help us to know how linked we are, how each one of our cares touches us all. Help us to ask for support and offer others our support so that we may rest in the solace of one another's love. And spirit of love, help us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, so we might fully embody love and resist hatred. Spirit of resistance, help us to stick up for what is right, even when we are tired or afraid. Help us to dream of the world as it should be and act to bring that world about. Help us to find hope each day. Spirit of hope, help us through this day and each day. Help us be present for all that is our life. For all of this, we pray. Amen and blessed be. I invite you to say with me the words to extinguish the chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. We're about to sing our closing song. You are welcome to stay right where you are and be held in the love of the congregation, or you are welcome to form a circle around the outer aisles as we sing. Our benediction this morning is Song of the Skyloom, a Tewa poem. O oh, our Mother Earth, O oh, our Father Sky, your children are we, and with tired backs we bring you the gifts of love. Then weave for us a garment of brightness. May the warp be the white light of morning. May the weft be the red light of evening. May the fringes be the falling rain. May the border be the standing rainbow. Thus weave for us a garment of brightness that we may walk fittingly where birds sing, that we may walk fittingly where grass is green. O oh, our Mother Earth, O oh, our Father Sky. Our worship has ended let our service begin. Go in peace and go in love. Blessings on your journey.